Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today for our webinar on planning for retirement. We have a great presentation for you today that will give you a little bit of a guideline of what you need to think about when it comes to planning for retirement. Uh, it's a very uh, unspoken of topic, so to speak, um, in the medical community and people don't really think about it uh, enough when, it, when they come to the time of retirement. And whether it's you know, three months, six months, one year, two years, doesn't matter how far in advance. The longer the better, obviously, but we want to make sure that we're here to, to guide you and assist you in any way possible. So let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about Cirrus, as we do have a number of new members joining us today. Founded back in 1994, headquartered in Toronto, we, we have two major components to our company. One is office lease negotiations, and one is healthcare consulting. And the healthcare consulting division, which I am part of, uh, provides billing support and operational support for physicians, both at the individual and group level. So we work with individual physicians across Ontario, and we work with groups as well. So physicians come to us and they have issues with their billing or want to make sure that they're being optimized, and we assist them with that. And then we also have groups that come and join us and, and work with us. And we provide uh, operational support from the group level as it relates to after-hours billing, um, and scheduling and, and things like that. So it's, it's really a, an all-encompassing tool that we provide, and again, both on the individual and group level. So the purpose of today's program is to get you thinking about retirement. And like I said earlier, it doesn't matter if it's two months out, six months out, a year, two years, three years, you need to start thinking about it. And obviously, the longer the better. But when it comes to the retirement planning process, there are a lot of moving pieces, and it really is advantageous to help, uh, to get help in, in all those aspects, because we come to you when we're sick, so you guys should come to us when, uh, when you need help as, as it relates to the business side of medicine. So we're going to give you a little bit more about what you need to know, who needs to be informed, you know, what do you need to think about, should you be selling, who should you be selling to, how do you find those right people to sell to, and, and everything in between. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first steps that you need to think about are whether or not you're going to be retiring on a full-time basis or part-time. And we have a lot of physicians that come to us and say, you know what, I'm thinking about retirement, I don't know if it's right for me just yet, but I want to cut back. That's great. So you've decided that it's going to be on a part-time basis. So what we're going to look for is someone to come in and work almost as an associate uh, or a locum to help you manage your practice moving forward. So no longer are you going to be working three, four, five days a week. You're going to have your locum work a couple days a week, and you're going to work a couple days a week. Again, the breakdown is very personal, so every physician is going to be very different. Um, but just getting to think like that, you know, you want to work maybe one or two days a week and have the locum uh, or the associate work two or three days a week to manage the practice. Maybe they can start to build up more patient base. And again, you want to see what works for you. Every single one of you is going to be different. Choosing a retirement date. Now, this is an important one because there's a lot of components that go into choosing a retirement date. And one might be your lease. Do you have a lease that expires in one year, two years, three years? Maybe you want to get out of it early. Maybe you're on a month-to-month. -month. You know, maybe there's provisions within your lease that say you cannot transfer it until the lease is over. And there's a whole bunch of different things that you really need to pay close attention to. And that's where our leasing division comes in. And then we have a team of experts that will be able to help and guide you as to what are your um, responsibilities as it relates to your lease. What are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? Informing your staff. Now, most of you have had staff that, you know, if you're thinking about retirement, you've probably had your staff with you for a number of years. It could be 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Who knows how long? Um, but you want to treat them right, and you want to make sure that they're taken care of, and, and you want to protect yourself from any wrongdoing. So do they have a formal employment contract? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, if they don't, it's very important to speak to your lawyer to find out exactly what you need to do. Again, depending on how long they've been with you, how you want to treat them, there's a lot of aspects there that really need to, to be spoken about with a lawyer to make sure that you're doing whatever you need to do. If a new physician is taking over, do your staff want to stay? Or does the, even, does the physician even want them to stay? And that's a conversation that you need to have, you know, again, do you want to have it too early? No, because you don't want your staff to get scared and run away and 
then you're trying to sell your practice and it doesn't come with staff or you know there's no option of having the staff there might not be as attractive to a potential buyer so you know speak with us we're going to figure out that right game plan to make sure that you're speaking to the right people at the right time so if you're in a group practice your governance agreement is something that you're really going to need to take a look at because there's some governance agreements that state you have to give X number of notice, um, three months, six months, one year. Do they have a, a vote on who you bring in? So if you have, if you're selling your practice and you find someone that you want that wants to buy it and you want them to take over, great. But does your group have a vote on that? Do they have a say in who joins them? If you're in a group practice where there's multiple people in one office it makes sense that they would want to have a, a say on who you bring in because there has to be a compa compatibility connection between them. You want to make sure that whoever is coming in is going to be the right fit because you don't want to leave your, your colleagues that you've been working with for so many years with someone that isn't going to be a fit for them. And again, how, how is your cost sharing agreement set up with your group? If you're in a, in a multiple physician office, you're sharing expenses, whether it's just for uh, rent or staff or whatever it is, there's a cost sharing aspect to it. And what are the shares broken up like? How did the lawyer or the accountant set up your corporations? How are you on a lease together? If, if everyone is named on the lease, wh what are the implications on assignment? Are you personally uh, committed to the, to the lease or did you sign it in your corporation name, which I hope you did? So th there's a lot of components there that you really need to think about. So going through your governance agreement, going through your, your cost sharing uh, agreements, just lining up all the documents that you have as it relates to your practice is very important and something that we help our, all of our clients with. Uh, do you want to sell your patient roster to them? So maybe they're, you know, you're one of the older physicians in the group and there's a bunch of younger ones. They've been having a hard time finding patients or growing their patient base or maybe they want to divvy it up amongst everyone maybe they want to buy your, your patient roster. So it's a little bit of a different component there where we're not looking for somebody else, but we're selling to somebody in the group and bringing on the associate to help you wind down. As I said earlier, maybe you, you don't want to be you know, full-time retired right away. You want to come in, you still want to do one or two days a week. Maybe there's some of the patients that you want to keep. Maybe there's some of the long-term care patients that you have that you want to keep. Whatever it might be, you want to maybe bring in somebody to, to help you wind down and for the eventual transfer. If you're in a solo practice, again, you still need to look at your, and by solo practice I mean just in your own office. You may still be part of a group, but you're in your own office. You don't have to worry about anyone else uh, on the lease, and you don't have to worry about giving other people notice and, and things like that. But you still need to advertise uh, about your upcoming retirement, so when are we going to advertise? How far in advance? What are we looking for? all those components that we want to speak about to, to make sure that we're taking the right steps. Also bringing on an associate, as we said earlier, making sure that your patients are taken care of leading up to retirement. You know, maybe you have to have surgery. Maybe you have to have, you have to go away for something. You know, maybe there's personal commitments. Whatever the case may be, you want to bring someone on and, and do so as a locum to make sure that they don't negatively affect the group or your own practice. And the lease agreement for your own practice, again, do you have it signed in your corporation or do you have it signed personally? Very important to know the difference. Very important to know which, you know, which it actually is and see what any, if any, are the restrictions laid out in your lease as it relates to you retiring or winding down or transferring it to somebody else. So if you have your medical professional corporation, which I'm assuming most of you do, um, convert to an ordinary corporation, close it completely, who knows, but you want to consult your lawyer and or your accountant to see how it was set up in the first place to see what you need to do moving forward. If you're leaving all your assets in there and you're not taking them out, probably want to leave it open and, you know, for cost sharing or, you know, dividends or whatever it, it's going to be, you want to make sure that you have it there for, for the appropriate amount of time. And then with your lease agreement, again, is it in your corporation or is it personal? And do you have personal liabilities to that? Uh, hopefully you don't. Hopefully it's in your MPC. But again, you might have to leave it open for a certain amount of time depending on what your lease says, if there's any chance of, you know, after you transfer it that somebody could come after you. Financial obligations to the bank, um, informing of any bank account closures that need to happen. So with the ministry, you obviously have a bank account uh, that all your funds are delivered to every month. So is that bank account staying open? Is that your main bank account? Um, 
do you need to have any stop payments made? If there are any recurring payments that you have based on your office, on, on for your lease or for your expenses or supplies or whatever it is, you want to make sure that you're obviously not continuing it to pay if you're not going to need it. Uh, from the insurance standpoint, again, if you're no longer going to be practicing, then you don't need to have the same amount of insurance. So re-examining your policies with your insurance advisors is very important. You don't want to overbuy and you don't want to underbuy. So it's very important to speak to the professionals, make sure that they know what you're planning on doing. So again, maybe you're just stopping your family practice, but you're going to be continuing something else. So you do need a certain type of insurance, but maybe not the same. So it's very important to speak with your advisors to make sure that you're making the right financial and insurance decisions. Patient notification um, is a tricky one because you don't necessarily want to tell the patients too early. If you're trying to sell your practice, telling the patients too early might scare them into thinking, oh my god, I'm not going to have a family doctor, I better start looking and they're going to sign somewhere else and then all of a sudden the value of your practice is going down because you're not actually transferring the same amount of patients anymore. So let's say, for example, you have a thousand patients and you, you tell them too early and typically we'll, we'll see a, you know, a 10 to 15 percent attrition rate, but maybe 20 percent or 25 percent are going to be gone because you told them too early, they got scared, they went and found other doctors. Maybe they've been with you for so long, they've just been traveling you to, um, to see you because it's you. And that's fine, that's going to happen, and that's sort of attributed in the 10 to 15 percent that you're going to lose or that the new physician is going to lose. But letting them know at the right time is very important. And again, every single one of you is going to have a different right time based on how that transition is going to happen, whether it's a prolonged transition where you have an associate coming in, whether it's a you know cold turkey on January 1st, I'm gone and so-and-so is coming in, great, so you want to let them know. Um, phone calls, letters, posters, emails, any type of information that you can provide to them is important because if the ministry does come calling one day and say, well, you know, we, we didn't think you gave enough notice, at least you have it in writing to say, this is when I sent it out, this is how much I, advanced warning I gave them, this is what, you know, all those things, you want to have it documented. So timing is very important as it relates to patient notification. So you, again, you don't want to go too early, you don't want to go too late, and you just want to make sure that you're doing right by the patients and making sure that you're giving them the opportunity to either stay with a new physician coming in or head over to a new physician if the, nobody is coming over or if they don't want to stay with the new physician. Patient records and EMR. So obviously you're, you're required to keep them for a minimum of 10 years if you're just retiring and, and not transferring them to somebody else and providing the patients with the opportunity to request a copy. Obviously we want to make sure that if the, phys if the patients decide they don't want to stay with the new physician, they want to look for a doctor closer to home or closer to work or you know, whatever the case may be, give them that opportunity to request a copy uh, to be transferred to a new physician. As it relates to your EMR, canceling your contracts obviously if necessary. If you're not going to be practicing anymore, there's no need to keep that contract open and pay your monthly fee. But if you're going to be transferring to somebody else, then maybe you can just transfer your contract to them or they can start a new one or whatever it is. But speaking to the EMR company is very important. And obviously maintaining confidentiality, so any uh, information on your computers you want to get rid of, make sure you do so appropriately. And there are a number of businesses that will help you do that. Also with your um, patient records, there, there are a number of businesses that will help store them for the time needed. So big picture here, you're going to wind down your practice, great, you, you thought about it, you're going to retire. So now let's look at the left side first, a new physician is coming in. You're going to transfer your roster, you're hopefully going to assign the lease to them, and hopefully there's going to be a staff transition as well. And all those components have to fall into place in the right time, so jumping the gun on one of them and before the other is not a good idea, so making sure that you follow the steps needed uh, before doing you know, before making any rash decisions is very important. And that's something, again, that we help our physicians with when they come to us and say, look, I want to retire by this date. I need to find someone. We put together a plan, a step-by-step -step plan, to make sure that we meet all of our goals and our deadlines and making sure, obviously, that the patients are taken care of first and foremost. If you're planning to walk away, who do you need to give notice to? You have to give notice, as we said earlier, to your patients, to your landlord, to your group, potentially. Speaking to the landlord, you want to ask about your security deposit. You want to ask about rent reconciliation if there's any adjustments that need to be made. How do you need to return the property? 
if they gave it to you in a blank slate, does it need to be given back in a blank slate? Do you want to take anything with you? Is that allowed in your lease? Is there any liabilities that you still have as it relates to your lease agreement or any other financial agreements that you have? All of those things that people don't think about on a regular basis need to be thought about. So who needs to know? Basically everyone. <laughs> you need to tell everyone that you're going to be retiring. But again, some people want to tell more than others. Some people will say, you know what, I, I don't want to let uh, the CMA know, or I don't want to let the OMA know. I just want to let the ministry know. And that's fine too. You know, everyone is going to be different. But the more you tell, the better off you'll be because you don't want any unforeseen issues coming up. All, all of a sudden, you know, in a year from now, they, somebody comes calling and says, oh, yeah, we need you to do A, B, and C. And you say, I've been retired for a year. I don't know what you're talking about. So better to let everyone know. Uh, from a ministry standpoint, the patient enrollment model um, declaration that you're going to be leaving is the most important. If you're going to be transferring a roster to somebody else, we're going to put that on the paperwork. If you're going to be walking away, we're going to put that on the paperwork. So everyone needs to know in the right time. So some of the services that we offer as it relates to retirement and your practice optimization, roster transfers, roster reconciliations, this is key because when selling a practice, you're really selling your roster of patients. That's the most important part of the, the whole sale aspect. So making sure that your EMR roster and your ministry roster are aligned is very important because oftentimes we see a roster from the ministry say, I have, you have 1,000 patients, but then your EMR roster says you have 1,200 patients. Uh-oh, where, where are those 200 patients? Why am, why am I not getting paid for those 200 patients? If you don't know and if you don't realize that, then transferring a roster that you think has 1,200 but only has 1,000, that could come by, back to bite you, but we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So a roster reconciliation is very important. Signing on new physicians, so add-on applications. Nobody wants to deal with ministry applications. That's what we're here for. Optimizing your practice. Again, if you are earning $400,000 a year, and we come in and we're looking and we're looking at all your bonuses and premiums and, and making sure your billing data to make sure that you actually are getting paid for all your diabetics and smokers and you know, home visits and everything in between, all of a sudden you're, you're going from 400000 up to 450000 That That's a big difference. And, and when selling a practice, that makes a huge difference. So making sure that you're optimizing your practice leading up to retirement is very important. Educating your staff, patients and potential incoming physicians with the posters, letters, phone messages, making sure that they're aware of what's going on. Don't leave them in, in, the, in the dark. Don't, you know, all of a sudden come on the, the 11th hour and say, oh, by the way, to your staff, we're leaving, and we're not coming back, and you guys are on your own. Not a great situation. You open yourself up to legal issues. It's, it's just not something you want to do. I don't anticipate anyone wanting to do that, but just making sure that everyone knows at the right time um, with the right information, answer any questions that they have is very important. So group planning for transitions, as I said earlier, if you're in a group and you have to give notice by a certain amount of time or your group can veto or has to vote on a new physician coming in, you have to make sure that you're, you're aware of all that and that's what your governance agreement or your cost sharing agreements are going to state and that's something that we will review with you. And practice valuations. What's your practice worth? You're going to hear rumors that some people are getting two months or three months or four months or six months. Your practice is worth what your practice is worth, not what anyone else's practice is worth. So just because somebody else got six months doesn't mean you will. And just because somebody else got two months doesn't mean you will. You could get more, you could get less. We need to pick a value that's fair based on your practice, based on your roster, based on your income, that you are receiving for your patients. And that's something that we work very closely with our physicians to make an educated decision on what should we value the practice at? What should we start our asking price at? Knowing that we're gonna most likely have to come down in price unless we get a bidding or which has happened. Um, you, you, know, you need to make an educated decision and that's again what we're here for. So some of the key takeaways for today. Transitioning your practice into retirement can be difficult and time consuming. We are definitely here to help and take that burden off your shoulders. The roster is the most important part of the transition, 
and we want to make sure that you know who is on your roster. Who is on your ministry roster should be the same as your EMR. So we want to make sure of that. And set a reasonable value. We don't want to ask $400,000 for a practice that's only worth two, and we don't want to ask $200,000 for a practice that's only worth one. At the end of the day, walking away is a tough decision. There, there's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of loose ends that need to be tied up. It, it's not something that you want to, a decision that you want to make overnight, but we're here to help. We're here to guide you through the whole process from beginning to end and make sure it's as seamless as possible. So that brings us to the end of the presentation for today. So again, thank you so much for joining me. And if you do have any questions, my contact details are there. Please feel free to send me an email.